There we go. And here we go. We're recording. Wonderful. So uh, just as I start, firstly, maybe, um, please feel free to open your microphones and ask me a question at any time. Um, if I can't hear you right away, uh, just scream louder. Um, I think this should be not just a presentation from me to you, but I would like this to be co-created as well. If you have any questions, comments, suggestions, uh, feel free to just shoot. Um, I will begin with a few words about myself, maybe, just very briefly for those that don't know me as well um, yet. My name is uh, Tim. I'm originally, uh, as you might hear from the accent, from Germany. Um, I have been in Toronto for a few months now. Um, my background is in business management. Um, so I studied business, uh, then started to work at uh, the Fraunhofer Society in Germany, which is Europe's biggest organization for applied research. And my focus there was already on uh, business transformations. So um, the service transformation and digital transformation mostly. I was a research associate there. Um, the work at Fraunhofer is uh, we, we take research, ground research that has been done at universities and our goal um, was to apply this research uh, in practice. So we would work a lot with companies and we would try to apply the models and theories that have been created in research to uh, those companies. Um, so I worked at as a research associate. I was a head of a research group on digital transformation. Um, until I decided to come to Canada. Since then, I'm an independent researcher um, for uh, innovation, uh, value creation. Um, and uh, so I've kind of tried to develop these topics further as I go along. Um, what we're talking about today, Service Innovation for Flourishing, partly has to do with my PhD topic, as I'll explain in a second. Um, and it's partly also sort of a pet project of mine that I do want to focus more on in the future. Um, and so I'm also very curious if any of you have any experience there. So to, lose, to not lose more time, um, Service Innovation for Flourishing is the title of the presentation today. I do have to say that I've used the word flourishing because I think it fits, but also because it's a word that is very common in this group. Um, what I'll be talking about today to me is um, service innovation for better services. Flourishing is a word that uh, is very closely associated to what I consider better, um, but I, I do think that also for companies that are um, simply conservative, that, that what we're going to talk about today um, will have some added value. Um, so let's look into what service innovation for flourishing means um, and where where the idea comes from. On the very left here, I know some of you uh, do like to hear a bit about the, the background, the theory, the research that's involved in, in what we're talking about today. Um, so at the very left, you can see my PhD thesis, Organizational Competence for Servitization. And for this thesis, um, a bit to the right, um, I've used some research from service dominant logic and service science. Both come out of um, business management with a focus on marketing and IT respectively. So they're, they're grounded in very traditional um, uh, research in that sense, I would say, but are on the other hand, um, very advanced in that they broke a lot of boundaries from traditional business research, which was uh, very intriguing to me at the time and continues to be. And uh, one of the, uh, the focus of service dominant logic has shifted in the last years very much towards institutions. So the middle row here that you see where it says institutions and organizations, institutional work, that's some research that I dug into um, for the, the topic of the presentation today. And then I guess a third stream that's important is on the very right, um, the book on the bottom, you probably know as it's, uh, I think a lot of the members from this group have contributed to this book which uh, talks about how we have to rethink strategic management and the book on top, The Great Mind Shift, I can only uh, strongly recommend. It's a German professor who has a lot of influence on the German government at the moment, who is also talking about the um, necessary mind shift um, regarding our economy that is going on right now. So that's a, a very interesting book to, to look into as well. So let's have a look into the question that I wanna address in the presentation today. Um, the main question that we're talking about is how can we create valuable services? And uh, depending on who you're talking to, you will probably get a lot of different answers to that question. Um, so I will also tell you what my, my specific perspective is that I'm taking today. 
my answer to this question today is by challenging the institutions that we use when we design services. Now, to understand that better, I want to quickly explain these two, uh, the two uh, concepts in red. Firstly, valuable to me doesn't mean services that make more money. It has a different meaning, and I will get into that a bit more, but it's very close to the flourishing concept. Secondly, institutions here doesn't mean that I want to challenge a government, for example, um, so institutions in that sense, but I'm talking about mental shortcuts that we use when designing services. So a major thing that always stood out for me is when we talk about service design, everyone always talks about how we should do things differently, and no one ever talked about how we should see things differently before we design services. And that's how I got into the topic of institutions of mental shortcuts that we take when, when designing services. So in order to answer that question today, um, there are three things that, three steps that we need to go through. Firstly, I wanna talk about institutional innovation to talk a little bit about what are institutions, which role do they play in innovation? What, which role do institutions play in service? And also what is a service really? And then, then last, um, designing for value, meaning how do we use what we've learned before to design more valuable services as our main question asks. So let's dive into the first part, uh, institutional innovation, and we'll talk a little bit about what these institutions actually are. Firstly, I want to start with a quote because I think the term institution in the way that I'm using it today is maybe not familiar to everyone. Another word that's uh, closely related might be a bit more familiar. That's uh, the word paradigm. And um, I'm citing Donella Meadows here, um, also a, a great read. Um, ask me for the, the link if you'd like to know. Um, she says paradigms are the sources of systems. People who have managed to intervene in a system at the level of paradigms have hit a leverage point that totally transforms systems. So what we're hearing here is that if we change paradigms, we can really make a profound difference. Of course, that can be very tough, but if we get to do that, then, then we can really make a strong impact. Now, institutions are what paradigms essentially, I would say, are made of or what paradigms are expressed through. And that's why I find it so important for service innovation to talk about these institutions because they, they define very much how we see and approach um, any innovation. Now, if I say paradigms are made up of institutions, what does that mean? Um, I'm sure you know that the photo I'm showing here on the right is no coincidence. This is the goal that uh, Germany scored to become world champion in 2014, and I like to see it wherever I go, so I try to implement it in this presentation as well. Um, moving on from that, um, let's look a little bit more into what these institutions that make up paradigms actually are. Uh, we have another quote on the bottom that says, institutions are patterns of practices, assumptions, values, beliefs, rules, and so on by which we organize and by which we provide meaning to our social reality. That means institutions define how we perceive the world and how we act in the world. Now let's use this example of football and, and see what that means. On a, on a very basic level, these institutions can be rules or laws. For example, a rule in football would be that you're not allowed to touch the ball with your hand. Um, that's a rule that changes entirely how you play football, how you behave, how you view the game. On a different level, the level of culture or norms, for example, um, there could be an institution that says complaining to the referee is okay or not okay. Um, if you follow football a little bit, you'll know that in different countries, this is handled very differently and it for sure um, influences, again, how you see and, uh, and act in the game of football. Fundamental beliefs are yet another step deeper where we think, for example, fairness is important. That's a fundamental belief that we have that influences our way to see football. And on a very, very basic level, we think winning is good. I think that is an unchallenged assumption that most football players have when they enter the game. Um, but it is obvious that that assumption very, very profoundly influences how we see and, and play the game. So without these assumptions, or these assumptions cloud our picture essentially of what's really going on in reality. And um, a guy called Bo Lotto explained that very well in his book, Deviate, which is also a great read that I can uh, very much recommend. Um, and he said, he's a, he's a neuroscientist. He said, when the brain processes an image, 
the outside information that we see only makes up about 10% of what we really see and what we really process. To complete this image, our brain relies on information that it previously stored in the past. So experiences from your life, biases of your culture, adaptive reflexes of your ancient ancestors. So a lot of these are formed through institutions. And, and as you can see here again, um, a large part of how you perceive the world is influenced by these institutions. Now that is of course very, very relevant when we think about innovation, when we think about service design, and especially when we think about service design for flourishing, because it, it sort of sets the stage for us when we enter that innovation process. Now, to illustrate that, that a little bit more, there's a famous Canadian that had something to say about that. Um, his name was Marshall McLuhan. Uh, he wrote uh, in his book, The, the Medium is the Message. Um, he said, uh, think of an innovation, uh, I would say, situation here. He said, when we're faced with a totally new situation like that, we tend to always attach ourselves to the flavors of the most recent past. We look at the present through a rear view mirror, we march backwards into the future. So what that means and what is illustrated so well by that drawing on the left is that we have a certain solution space, a certain perspective on the world um, with, for each situation that we enter and especially in a world that is as dynamic and fast changing as our world right now, where we're faced with many situations that need um, innovativeness, creativity, um, having this specific perspective is a liability rather than an asset, which it uh, might, might have been in the past. So I wanna give a, a very um, hands-on example about that, um, that maybe will illustrate the importance of these uh, uh, institutions a little bit more that I think all of us can relate to right now. Um, think of this as your COVID-19 solution space, the little square in the middle. This is how you think we should approach uh, handling this pandemic, um, the steps we should take, and, and how you kind of make sense of this whole thing. Now, on the side are walls that I will put up now, and these walls uh, make up your solution space. These are the institutions that you consciously or unconsciously work with when you think about COVID-19. At the bottom, we have very easily uh, perceivable ones that are maybe also easy to change. You might have a certain stance on whether handshakes are okay or not, whether in-person meetings are okay or not. Should we travel for leisure right now or not? Um, what about personal hygiene? These are things that sort of define your solution space, but you would probably relatively easily be able to understand them and maybe even change your stance on them. On the side, we have a bit more profound institutions. For example, on the right side, you might um, think that we must save the planet. So that will, um, in a way, influence how you think about COVID. Or that we must save as many lives as possible. That might influence how you stand on having a lockdown or not having a lockdown. Um, that individual freedoms are non-negotiable, that economic growth creates well-being, and so on. Again, institutions that, that limit your ability to see um, the solution space for 19 in its totality. And on the very profound level, we maybe have ideas that humans are separate from nature or that progress is good. Um, these are often very unchallenged assumptions that we make. And so the question is, of course, if we want to now design flourishing services, what can we do? Um, because now here we see a solution space and we see the institutions around them. But usually when we enter an innovation situation, we don't know what our restrictions are, these mental shortcuts that we use. So the way, a very basic way of going about that is to ask a simple question. And that question would be, why? Why am I thinking a certain way? Why am I acting in a certain way? What are the assumptions I use um, to do that? And um, I wanna give you one example of how asking why can uh, start untangling these institutions that we might not even be questioning. The example I want to give here is um, these are headlines from newspapers, old newspapers, but I think they're very applicable now with digital transformation. And they're very skeptical of automation. They say automation might end jobs, unskilled jobs in 10 years. Um, automation is linked to the jobless count. And it says automation is looming large in the labor picture. So a very negative image of, of automation. Now, I'm not saying that image is wrong. I just want to dive a little bit into why we might think like that. And I think a basic uh, assumption that we have when, when we think like that is that jobs, having jobs equals having good life. And the question is, is that really the case? And why would we maybe be thinking like that? 
so the side of the equation that I would um, like to remain to keep steady is having a good life. I think that is, that is the goal that most of us are striving for. The question is, what happens when we untangle the job concept on the left side? Um, well, jobs usually are, are constituted by work. We do some sort of work, and for that work, we get money. Work for money equals a good life is the level we're on right now. So now we can again ask the question, why would we think like that? Is that really the case? Or is there maybe another way to achieve a good life? So if we un again untangle the concepts on the left, we might get to the conclusion that we don't have to do work. We might want to do meaningful activities. And at the same time, we need material subsistence. And if we think about it in that way, there might be other ways to achieve material subsistence and to have meaningful activities, which would give us probably an even better life than to do that through, through the old concept of jobs. Um, if we think about automation in this example or digital transformation, in, in the beginning, it was the, the promise that, um, that, that mankind would be freed of doing these tedious jobs that machines can now do. And so we would be free to do more meaningful activities. And suddenly we're scared of losing jobs. So, so this could be a way of arguing um, that maybe losing jobs doesn't necessarily have to be a negative way, thing if we can still have material subsistence in a different way. One more example from a more um, practical, uh, a current example here that uh, maybe isn't flourishing as, as uh, I would say, but that again shows how institutions change through innovation is um, Uber and Lyft as a service. When we think about how these institutions can change, um, we can ma maintain some of the institutions that we have, we can disrupt some of them or simply change some. And um, let's have a quick look at what Uber uh, did to the taxi market um, when, it, when it came and which institutions it maintained or changed. For example, on the left side for maintenance, um, when we use Uber, we still pay for distance traveled. We still have a customized pickup and drop off. We still use traditional cars. Those are institutions from the taxi market that are still maintained in, uh, when we use Uber or Lyft. At the same time, important institutions have been disrupted. So now we don't have professional drivers anymore. We don't have cash payments anymore. We don't need to flag down a car and uh, we don't have a regulated industry. I'm not saying that all of these changes are good. I'm just saying that looking at it from an institutional perspective enables us to see the, the changes that, uh, that can happen through service innovation and the power of, of asking why and when we're trying to, to achieve change. So now that we know what institutions are, um, let's look a little bit about uh, on their role in, um, in service. And the first question I would like to ask you is, um, what exactly is service? Because um, as a, a service researcher, I've come across a lot of different definitions uh, throughout the years. And there are certainly very different views on what a service is. And I would just like to um, see what your perception is so far and um, establish a shared definition before we go on. So I have four definitions here and I would give you, while I explain them and you read through them, a little bit of time just quickly to write your favorite answer in the chat. Um, and then, then I will uh, tell you what the definition is that at least we will go with for today. Um, so the first definition says, and these are all, by the way, used in, or have been at least, and some are used in service theory. So the first one says a service is any offering that is not a product. Um, the second one has some constituting um, characteristics of a service. So for example, it's intangible. You can't touch a service. It's heterogeneous. When you get a haircut, for example, it will turn out a little bit different every time. Inseparability means the inseparability of production and consumption of a service. And perishability means that you can't store a service. You can't put it in a warehouse and keep it there for a while. The third definition says that service is the fundamental basis of every, any activity. And the fourth definition says uh, it just enumerates a number of services because it says there actually isn't a certain characteristic that, um, that, that uh, constitutes a service. So I would like to invite you now to write in the chat uh, which definition you think is the correct one, the one we'll be going with. And 
then in 30 seconds, I will let you know. Gives me the chance to take a sip of water. Oh, interesting. We have a fifth definition. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, that's that's what I like about this group. Um, I think we already have some food for discussion uh, later. Um, so just to summarize what people have said so far, um, Michael has provided a new definition. Uh, Josh says number two is the correct definition. Laurie agrees with all of them to a certain extent. Uh, Griff has to explain what 30 second PhD is. <laughs> Um, Simon says he's not sure if he agrees with any of these, and oh, Griff says all of these, maybe. The experiential aspect and the activities related to an offering. Interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that is very much not, not far away from what we're, we'll be going with. I think for now, um, let's keep this. Um, just keeping reading for a circular design model service would be addressing a market need for a product value chain. Interesting. I like that all of you are bringing an, a very individual um, view to this. Maybe we can uh, dive into this a little bit deeper in the discussion. Um, seeing the time, I think I will for now go on with the presentation, but feel free to jump in if you like. Um, so indeed, the one that I will be going with for now is uh, oh, my laptop is closing perhaps. The suspension is rising. One second. If not, I can already tell you well, while my laptop is trying to come back to life. Um, in fact, the definition that we will go with for today is number three service is the fundamental basis of any activity. Um, there we go, wonderful. The fundamental basis of any activity. Um, that might sound very unusual, and um, I do realize that none of you chose option three. Maybe let me explain why I do believe that, and um, then maybe things will get a little bit clearer. Um, the definition for services in the understanding of service dominant logic is that service is the application of skills and knowledge for the benefit of another actor or of oneself. So here we can already see that this is a, a definition that, that varies a lot from other definitions we might have heard before, or the ones you've seen before. Um, we're simply talking about us applying the skills and knowledge we have for our own benefit or for the benefit of someone else. And I think here it's already um, a bit easier to see that there might be a, a wider application for service um, than we might have thought before. In fact, I do think we do think that that is the fundamental basis of any activity. Let's look into that a little bit. Number one is very easy. Um, this is a prime example of a service. We have two companies. One might be a logistics company. One is a production company. Logistics company applies its skills and knowledge in transportation. Um, to provide a service for the benefit of the production company. That one is easy. Government and citizens might similarly be easy. Government applies its skills and knowledge to hopefully provide a, a pleasant living environment for its uh, citizens. This one here might be a little bit less intuitive in terms of a service. Um, for example, think of the situation that we're in right now. If you think I'm on the left side um, and you're on the right side of this picture, then right now I am using um, the skills and knowledge that I have to hopefully provide some sort of benefit for you guys. Um, while this might still be, although we're, we don't have a money exchange here and it's, it's explicitly not about monetary exchanges as the definition says, um, this might still be relatively easy to grasp. I would go as far as to say, think of sitting at the breakfast table with your family um, and you just have a conversation or let's say you're putting butter on your bread, you're using your skills, your knowledge to put, you use the knife, the butter, the bread to make a breakfast for yourself. Um, in the same way, if you have conversation with your family, you will use your skills and your knowledge in conversation making um, to hopefully make a pleasant experience for your family. 
Importantly, of course, um, this isn't a one-way street, but at the same time, your family also does the same at the breakfast table for you. So what we're talking about when we talk about service is always some sort of an exchange. Um, so your family in that case will also apply skills and knowledge for your benefit um, or what we call service rights that could be money um, in, a, in an actual financial economic transaction. But as I said, we're not limited to that here. So we have a system that interacts. Let's maybe not call it an exchange, let's call it an interaction. Um, what's important to notice about that is that it's also not an interaction in isolation, but that in order, coming back to us here right now, if I'm on the left, I have to draw on a lot of resources in order to make this happen. For example, I'm using a laptop right now that was made by a company. Um, the government of Canada is allowing me to, to be inside the country right now. At the same time, you guys are drawing on a lot of resources in order to be able to be here and follow this. Um, some are similar to me and, and also some might be, um, as we saw before in the acknowledgement in the introduction, might be natural resources. So we're also always in any interaction dependent on having an environment, a functioning planetary natural environment, a societal environment that allows us to be here. So the definition of service that I want to use today um, goes much further than normal definitions of service, I would say, or, or previous definitions of service, in that it says we're talking about any situation um, that involves interaction between actors where skills and knowledge are applied, um, and it's always an integration of resources that, that needs to happen. So now that we've established an understanding of what service is, and we know before, from before that institutions are extremely important, of course we want to know what, how can institutions be important when designing such service systems as we see one here right now. So the final chapter of, of the presentation today um, will look at how we can innovate to create what I would say is more value. And at the beginning here, I want to introduce a little process that might uh, just remind you of the institutions that we had talked about before. So how do we, if we don't know those, we can ask why, we will ask why, but how do, if we look at a service system like the one we just saw, think of our interaction right now, how do we identify the institutions that maybe we would like to change? Well, firstly, institutions often um, become visible where there are emotions and where there is friction. Think of the public debate around, for example, Black Lives Matter right now. Think about uh, debates about climate change. Think about um, the economy. Think about COVID. Wherever emotions and friction arise, that is often where people have different institutions in their mind, and these, these are creating a friction when they interact with each other. So this is where we can see that somehow institutions in a situation don't align with each other. In a second step, what we're going to do is we will map the institutional arrangement. Now, because we don't have that much time anymore today, I had to take out um, a few slides that would have shown you how we can do that precisely, but we could talk about that later. Um, once we have mapped the institutions that are relevant for the service system, we're going to evaluate them um, and the assumptions that we use uh, for, these, for these institutions. And we will think about, well, are these institutions firstly true? Do we agree with them? Are they worthy of, uh, of, of changing? Will any profound change happen if we spend time on changing these institutions? And is it even realistic to change those institutions? And lastly, we will try to develop an alternative institution set. And as we look at this process, I want to invite you, because we talk about flourishing today, to think about the transition that maybe we're seeing from, from traditional economics to a more flourishing economy and more flourishing services. I'm sure we can start, and that is the challenge that I see, we can start thinking about the institutions that are prevalent in services that we come across every day that represent that old school economic thinking, I would say, and how could those be transformed towards a more flourishing um, uh, economic thinking and thus more flourishing services. Now I do want to, at the end of this presentation, go into that topic a little bit and maybe then lead into the discussion through that. Um, firstly, another quote that says how important these mainstream economic ideas are from um, John Maynard Keynes, who said the ideas of economists and political philosophers, both when they are right and when they are wrong, are more powerful than is commonly understood. 
indeed the world is ruled by little else. And I'm sure many of you agree as I do with the statement and that is part of uh, the, the, the core of my presentation today, I would say. So what are these um, economic assumptions, these old school economic assumptions that we're dealing with? Um, I've just listed a few here. I'm sure you've, you've heard of them before, you've thought of them before, you've used them in your own work before um, in trying to overcome them. Um, essentially, a lot here centers around the idea of a rational economic man. So we are perceived as people that are acting rationally, that are maximizing their self-interest. Um, when we think about value, we think about utility. Um, so it's only about maximizing happiness. Happiness is quantified. It is being put in monetary terms. So we try to maximize um, money and, and, and outcome in that sense. We have an idea of growth as being unlimited. We have an idea of the economy as being separate from nature, separate from society. So we have a very reductionist and separatist approach to viewing the economy. And, and as you all know, um, these institutions, these ideas are so deeply ingrained that, is, that it is extremely hard for, for all of us, I guess, to really um, come forward with, with uh, flourishing services, um, flourishing ideas that take hold in society. So I would say the way for us as a community also to kickstart this, to kickstart institutional innovation, um, is to have new assumptions about value. Value as not being utility, value as not being necessarily measured in money, and especially value as not being um, bigger the more we have um, as, as people, um, the more we can serve our self-interest. So what are these new assumptions about value that I want to briefly introduce here today? All of these also come from service dominant logic. Um, and essentially what they're saying is that value is not just money. Value is viability of a system. It is well-being for people. It is robustness and agility, as we can also tell now uh, in, in times of COVID. So value is so central. It is the reason why we interact. Value is also multidimensional. There is no universal measure for value. Value is co-created in systems, as we just saw, and value is emergent and experiential, so it cannot be predetermined. What do these mean? Firstly, just briefly again, coming back to this picture, well, if value is co-created in systems, that means that we're dependent on the systems around us. We're dependent on the planetary system, on nature. We're dependent on society. I'm dependent on you guys uh, being able to be here as much as you're dependent on me being able to be here and do this. So when we design services for flourishing, we have to design with and for the entire system. Secondly, if we look at value as being more than just utility, um, we can, for example, look to Manfred Max Neve and his fundamental human needs, which I won't go into depth now. But the guideline to use for service design here would be to design services for the true needs of stakeholders and not for the maximization of a, of a metric. This takes me to the third one, which means multi is, uh, value is multidimensional. Um, this is an example of what YouTube does wrong, as I would say. Um, all of us go to YouTube and it can be great for that, to learn an instrument, to face our fears, for example, or to laugh with friends. Those are true reasons to go on YouTube. What YouTube does, on the other hand, is on the right side, it just measures the number of clicks and video views. So because it can only measure that, it will never know if it truly um, achieved the, the value we were looking for, for example, to really learn an instrument. All it can measure is how much time we spent there and how many videos that we clicked. And how do you do that? Well, by suggesting videos that will make me very emotional, that might play with my psychology and make me uh, click things that I may be afraid of and give me a totally different experience than the one I was looking for. So this is how measuring simply one um, quantified measure can, can uh, change our services in a way that does not provide value at all. And lastly, um, value depends very much also on the context of any service. So if I go to the beach and the environment is dirty, my, my value that I gain out of it and experience will be entirely different. Value emerges over the entire experience. It can't just be measured where I buy a certain product. If I use my phone and it dies three days later, then it certainly wasn't of that value to me um, as, as you might think when I 
paid hundreds of dollars for it. And every experience is different. Um, so I would go into these a bit more if we have more time. Um, again, I'm cutting things short a little bit and sorry if I race through this a little bit, but um, we can again discuss it, discuss it later. So I want to close with this um, statement that for me is also a little bit of a call to, to you, um, which says our task is to map the reservoir of ideas, assumptions, values, practices that support the mainstream economic view of value creation. Once we do that and once we understand those, as we were just seeing, this unlocks our liberty and our literacy to design flourishing services for true value. And um, I, I have the picture of space behind here isn't just a coincidence. I put that there because it relates to something that you guys might know under zero gravity thinking. It's essentially we have to be able to shed these, these uh, invisible boundaries that we have when, when developing flourishing services in order to really unlock our possibility to develop these services. And uh, I would like to going forward, um, and that's my invitation, to think about how we can design tools, um, maybe methods that help us to really understand when we look at a service, where is the, the old um, economic paradigm prevalent and which, which institutions do we need to change in order to have flourishing services. And uh, that is it from my presentation for today. Um, I am now happy and open for uh, contributions, questions, criticism, and all of your thoughts on what a service uh, is and is not. <laughs> Martin, could I start off with a question? Absolutely. This is really, really interesting, and I've, I've excellent talk, and I've made um, quite a few notes. Thank you. One thing. I'm, I'm kind of struggling a little bit with your def definition of institution because at this moment in time, it, I'm going to stress the word appears because we, we haven't had time to explore this in detail. Yeah. But your definition of institution, I think it's really interesting, especially as we have this concept of institutionalized, which is like institutionalized is something quite fixed. Yes. But I was wondering if you could go back to your slide with the Uber example. Absolutely. Because originally I was thinking that your definition only really covers mental, maybe cognitive biases, assumptions and ideas. Mm. But your slides seem to suggest that institutions are, can be broader than just something mental. And I'd like to just ask yes. you about the breadth of your concept of here you go, institutions change, like the rating system. Yeah. The pay, a payment system. When I saw this slide, it seemed to tell me that originally I was thinking you, the concept of institution was mental. <laughs> and, and absolutely, this is a critical part. If we change our kind of cognitive biases, assumptions and ideas, yeah. it expands our creativity. But here, institution seems to be something very, very broad. If I look at your definition in this slide, would you be able to comment a bit on just Absolutely. how the concept of institution is? Yes, um, and I do have a slide that's that's one of the theoretical slides that I didn't show now. Um, <laughs> because they are they can be a bit dense but um firstly you're absolutely right if you say that because of the the idea of institutionalization that is exactly related to this and that means that things are more fixed so the idea of institutions is always this is something that is routinized this is something that is sticky in a way right and that's why mm. it's so hard for us sometimes to see these things and to change these things so if I just, um, if there's one mishap, something I do once, I wouldn't call that an institution. It would always be something that is a recurring pattern, I would say. Um, so firstly about that, absolutely right. It is, it is something that is sticky in that way. And then let me quickly jump down. Sorry, I always have to move around all the Zoom windows in order to see my presentation. So I do have a slide here. Let's look at this for a second. So you were asking about the breadth of what institutions yeah. are. And I think it's, it's a bit more apparent here. Um, the important concept to know here is, is a concept called performativity. That means that these things can be mental, 
but they will always show in the real world through actions and through things we make. For example, our technologies are only the way they are. For example, if I think of Facebook or a laptop or so on, because of the institutions we have mentally. And so, for example, the, the lowest uh, line here, um, artifacts, would be that institutions can show themselves in artifacts. So those could be objects that comply with certain specifications, with standards, or something that possesses symbolic value. And to give an example, um, I, I did it here for the SSBMG meeting. Some artifacts could be a, a normative artifact that I have seen the first time that I've joined uh, our meetings were the reusable water bottles that everyone had. And I felt really bad because I had a plastic water bottle with me and I realized this is some sort of a, a socialized institution in this group that we use reusable water bottles. Um, it could also be a, an SDG pin that people have that is maybe more a, a, a something of symbolic value that we use. But so <laughs> institutions can very much show themselves in, in artifacts. Um, they can show themselves a line above in activities and practices and also in relational systems. For example, um, how we organize a company. Is it very hierarchical? Is it more team based? So these would all be what we call carriers of institutions where they become apparent. I have a, I have a question. Thanks. So in, in some of the work that we've been doing, I've been doing in the past, um, where our definition of institution is really the wet when the idea or ideal of the person or persons who are creating something for the good of others or for some other purpose, um, when the number of people of community around that comes together and then that um, distance between the original reason for coming together becomes separated and the um, organization or company or institution becomes an entity in itself, which then has uh, potentially functionaries or um, mm -hmm. activators that are not seen as individual activators. Is, the, is that something, uh, maybe not explaining it right because I wasn't in that mindset when I started this conversation, but is that because these aren't individuals, they're not people, they might not even be groups, they're no. more of the, the thing that exists because of the reason it was created, but separated from the reason that it's created. So you're wondering if that would be an institution in that sense as well, or maybe? I think it is. An, I think in my definition of institution, it's that separation from the idea. <laughs> because the, so these things, the rules and laws and the governance systems, they're not individualized in any way typically anymore. There's, it's the standardization that happens to make things smooth, smoother, um, which is not necessarily yes. To the individuals that they were created for. Yeah, and and I mean that is the the core concept, I guess, of the uh, of these institutions that they are they are not um, necessarily individual. They are more for society how we organize ourselves and to make it easier. Because if we imagine if we didn't have any of those for any given situation, if we had to think through all options, we we would never be able to do anything. So we need these neural shortcuts, I would say, in order to make it easier for us to act. And so you're absolutely right. These these are standardized in a way which which again makes it so hard to change them in many cases right the other side of that from what you're just talking about to change rule of law you know there's laws about things that you can and can't do but just because the law says you can do something doesn't mean you should do something and so yes. does that fit into this conversation absolutely so the the regulative pillars where you just said rules and laws that, that is something where um if i don't do it there will be some sort of guilt attached to that um, but that doesn't mean that it's the right thing to do. The, the normative pillar in the middle is more about what a society considers the right thing to do. So here it's not about guilt, but it's more a difference between shame and honor, for example, if I do it or I don't do it, right? So I could break a law, but still be considered honorable because I broke it for all the right reasons, um, essentially. And the cultural cognitive one on the, the right side is, is the most ingrained one. That is where it's about a difference between um, understanding and confusion. So once I move out of that institution, I will not even be able to really understand what's going on anymore because this is fully how I frame my reality. That's those are the three different pillars here. Uh, can I can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. 
Uh, also, I think somebody's mic was on there a second ago. I picked up a bunch of static. I don't know if somebody else did. Um, I'm sorry. Somebody, I'd like to ask. I didn't, I didn't get that. Oh, oh, there's a mic that uh, was on a second ago, and oh, I just I grabbed see. a bunch of uh, noise, just letting Thanks. somebody know if you can't, because sometimes you can't hear your own uh, your own noise. Um, I'd like to ask you uh, about um, about institutions and about um, how you think that might relate to um, patterns or um, maybe even like uh, hegemony uh, would be uh, would be things I'd be thinking about. Um, and so when I'm thinking about an institution, one of the examples I've often um, gone back to recurringly is uh, is marriage. Um, okay. And so you've got the institution of marriage. Okay, so it's not necessarily a physical thing, but there are artifacts, as you, you're talking about, your objects possessing symbolic value, your rings, uh, there's mm -hmm. rituals associated with it. Um, the government maybe has its own, its own view of it versus uh, the particular ritual of your, um, your culture. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I'm just wondering about the, inter, the, um, the intersection of those things. Uh, so if you've got various bodies or agents or whatever factors that are coming into play mm -hmm. um, that are uh, co-establishing co or co-creating the institution, mm -hmm. um, how do you think that factors in over time? Uh, and like, do you just have any thoughts on that, on that intersection? Uh, if you, and, and marriage, I think, is a good example because... It, it repeats, but it also varies, right? Different countries in the world have different marriage rituals, um, yes. but there's sort of like a known thing, like people understand conceptually what a marriage is uh, in India versus a marriage here. Um, I would say loosely speaking at least. So just curious if you have thoughts on that. Yeah, um, absolutely. Thanks for the question. That's a great question. I'm just trying to get my presentation to let me out and let me show a different slide, but I, I'll just um, try to answer it uh, without the slide for now. Um, so that's very right. And it's very important to, to notice that in any situation, in any given situation, we usually don't have a very clean institutional arrangement that all points in one direction. But as you just said, the institution of marriage can be viewed in many different ways. And we, in any situation, we have conflicting um, institutions that might interact with each other. Um, and so the way to think of that, and I still can't get out of here, oh, maybe I can now. For example, here, that is, that is I think that relates to um, what you were asking. Um, just please uh, only focus on the top line that says uh, institutional orders, family, religion, state, market, profession, corporation, etc. These are ways in which I can approach any kind of situation. So if I'm in a family and someone is in need, then I will, uh, my, my propensity to maybe help them will be a different one than if I'm in a market mindset, for example. In a market, I will ask for something in return to help someone. In a family, I will, I will look for loyalty. But of course, in any uh, given um, situation, I'm not fully just in a market mindset. I'm not fully in a family mindset, but, but these mindsets will somehow be mixed. And so it's very hard to just untangle um, that one situation is clearly only uh, a family situation, clearly only a market situation. And especially lately, we've seen the market come into all kinds of social interactions where suddenly we think of cost-benefit uh, uh, questions that, that before didn't have that problem at all. Um, and, and so what I'm, I guess I'm saying, and maybe coming back to your example of marriage is that um, Marriage is again a, a concept under which we subsume certain ideas of what it means to live together, what that should entail. So we're in the normative part, maybe a regulative, uh, in the regulative way, different governments have different ideas about that. And so, so a concept like that, depending on how it is interpreted um, through institutions can, can differ from situation to situation, as I was just saying, or from place to place. I don't know if that helps, but otherwise feel free to ask on. I see a thumbs up. Okay. I, I'm not sure if that was really to your question, but uh, I'll take the thumbs up. <laughs> um, do we have any other ideas or questions out there? Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. 
Hi, Michael. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm following what, what is called the Game B movement. I just posted a link to it if you're interested. A, and they're, they're talking a lot how, how we go from a win-lose uh, compet competitive society to a win-win uh, yeah. collaborative society. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, um, did you post the link? Sorry, um, I posted the link to an uh, interview released uh, yesterday. Uh, Game B this weekend. Or so. Yeah. Uh -huh. So there's a great definition of, of the movement. There, I don't know if you know uh, John Bevic, uh, Toronto University. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So he's, he's involved in that now through the meaning crisis and the meta crisis yes. definition of this. Yeah. Absolutely. So well, I don't wonder what, what your thought is like for. for to go from a competitive society to a, to a collaborative society when creating value, so. Absolutely. Um, I think that's one of the, the absolute major parts. I'm, I'm sure competition is, I, I wouldn't completely jump towards collaboration and say competition can never be good. I mean, I've, I've played tennis or I play tennis, for example, and I know that even if you play with a teammate, you're fiercely competitive, but that makes both of you better. And it's not competition in a, in a mean way, right? So I would never mm -hmm. say competition is always bad. But if we look at where the concept of competition um, that, that we're employing right now, that, that, I mean, all of our economy is about competition. And, and that comes from the ideas of economists 250 years ago when the thinking was entirely different, the focus was entirely different. Um, I think it was Thomas Malthus who, who very much brought out the concept of uh, everything uh, being in competition and through that value emerging. And, uh, and if we look at evidence uh, now from, from nature, especially plants, also animals, there's, um, I think it was always linked to, to Darwin and to the concept of evolution and competition and evolution. And so back then, economists said, we will also implement this in our economic models. But now from all the natural sciences, there's, there's so much evidence that cooperation is, is an equally big part in creating value in nature at least that there's no reason for us in our economy to focus on on competition alone and so um, i do think that that our focus on, on competition is extremely ingrained um, and and that is one of the the major parts that i would say hold us back from creating value absolutely because essentially what what's happening is um, i mean we are again we have this idea that we're only focusing on ourselves and resources are scarce so i'm trying to fight everyone out there for the most resources and we're all going against each other and i mean just like going away from any theory for me if i go outside and i go into any shop i, I go to canadian tire i'm not uh, they're by far not the only ones but people harass me to buy some sort of or to get some sort of credit card and they will try to talk me in another shop into buying something else. It's all about competition, right? It's all about luring the customer in, getting him to give you the money. It's not at all about really providing a good experience anymore. I go out there and I, I feel like n almost nowhere that I go is about really giving me a great experience. And that simply for me, common sense is that can't be creating the best value we can, right? So uh, to me, a competitive model would much more bring that out. like to um, point to a, a little square on uh, the matrix um, one of the authors anyway the the thing that caught my eye was uh, structural no sorry institutional isomorphism or organization structural isomorphism I think we had yeah that's right um, and so if you are uh, is this where you saw it Yes. Yeah. Um, how, how do we escape from that? Um, I think what you presented is about um, institutions or organizations that have time and talent uh, to invest in uh, challenging assumptions. Mm -hmm. um, but it seems that even once you have, uh, you know, a, an innovative organization, um, how does it keep from kind of calcifying and, or, or maybe um, mirroring uh, what everyone else is expecting of it? Because, you know, as you point out, uh, or, or I didn't know, but cultural cognitive, you're saying that column is kind of like the most. Deeply uh, ingrained one, yeah. 
brain most influential perhaps on our behaviors or thinkings? Yes. Yeah. How to negotiate that? How to avoid falling into that again and again, maybe is what you're saying or? Yeah. Um, that's, that's a really good question. I'm not sure if I have a, a great answer for that. Um, because, uh, I mean, I think these, these take the longest because until something gets really so ingrained that we don't even notice it anymore, that it is so normal for us that we, we, we don't even perceive it anymore, essentially, which is, uh, what, what these say. It's just so normal that, that we're doing it. Um, it takes a long time. So I, I, maybe that's why I'm focusing so far on, on breaking these up. Um, I do think that to a certain extent, maybe there will be some ambidexterity that, that you will maybe fall into new uh, ways of going. I, I'm thinking now of, of climate change. Um, there, I could see a, a new society that works in a certain way that really does not um, deteriorate the planet. And so maybe that is where we want structural isomorphism and we, we do not need to move out of that again. At the same time, I think constantly re-employing the, the, the methods that make us question what we're doing. I, I think that is just an ongoing process that needs to, to keep happening, right? Um, so it's not, a, it's not a transformation like we used to think of them where you unfreeze and you change and then you refreeze and then you leave it. But it's uh, the concept of evolutionary organizations that just constantly question um, what they're doing, how they're seeing the world, um, how they're positioning themselves in it. I think that probably comes closest to how an organization could achieve that. Hey there. I don't know Hi, how Kelly. I ask a question. Go ahead, please. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, my name is Kelly. Um, I, I, um, thanks, Tim, for, for your talk. It's, it's really um, re relatable to, I, I, I've got a talk coming up for Global Change Days, and we're looking at organizational transformation. Uh, what I was using for my, uh, my example was clothing. So just going back to what you were speaking about in terms of value creation, I've probably been on the path as long as you have in terms of just telling my, my uh, former clients that the market was shifting and what the meaning of value was shifting as well. As I was trying to move them into a, a triple bottom line or sustainable uh, products, uh, whether that was in apparel or something different. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that what I wanted to add to this conversation was whether, I guess I'm just checking in with you to see if I'm understanding correctly mm -hmm. on institutions whether something like a level playing field, it, it, it's somewhat paradoxical. One has to start and be the, uh, the starting point versus that the living uh, level playing field is already there. Unless it was a government or institution that was putting in a penalty or something like a carbon tax for everyone to be on board now. It, does, does that sort of, am I interpreting uh, what you're speaking about in terms of uh, both your definition of institutional and this piece of paradox. Could you reiterate that? So, so you're wondering um, about the, the level playing field in terms of now companies moving towards sustainability, that it isn't a level playing field. Did I understand that right? Well, uh, it certainly isn't. A, a, yeah. well, when we're talking about um, um, moving towards products oh. that are only uh, profit driven or, or uh, corporations that are driven by quarterly, uh, quarterly profit increases versus creating a value product that yes. nobody needs another pair of black pants. Yeah. But, um, you know, I, 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 I don't know. Um, I Absolutely. guess there's a whole bunch of little threads that I'm sticking out there. No, I mean, that, that I think is the main, main challenge that all of us are facing, that, that this current economic system is so deeply ingrained and there definitely is not a, a level playing field. And as you say, I've, I've been there dozens of times where, where you start, you know, talking about things and, and there's always this moment where you go too far away from that and, and then you see that, that they just lose interest. And, and so the, the only, I mean, we've been thinking about that a lot and a way to level the playing field is to, that's why we have the business case for sustainability, right? So you suddenly start framing everything again from a business context, which can work, but which I, I don't really like to do because then you're not really changing the paradigm again. Um, I, I guess the thing that currently works uh, best for me is that uh, 
something that COVID has done is that it's made very many businesses very aware of how fragile the world is and how the current system is not equipped to deal with that dynamic and with that fragility. And so they're really, now they're, they're coming and wondering, hey, how can I be more resilient? And it's all about resilience. And, and then you can use that as an opening door to say, hey, look, um, it's about more than that because suddenly these changes that are coming, you don't know what's coming. So you have to keep your entire environment um, in, in view to understand what's happening in the world. And that's something that they get. Um, and, and so you can say that managing for that entire environment, for society, for nature, to keep that in mind is, some, is a step that they're more willing to make right now. Um, and then also saying that acting in a way that essentially makes you not just having a strategy for the next quarter, as you say, to make money anymore, but to more have a vision of how you can provide uh, value and to be flexible in how you live that vision, depending on how the environment changes, that flexibility is what can get you um, through these, these times. And I guess that that is maybe a little bit closer to, you know, sustainability yeah. because you have that system view and, and you're not fixed anymore on the next quarter, but it's still not there, I guess, right? Well, I mean, to your point, the new value is much more of a service base than it uh, for, for, traditional manufacturers where they're producing a, a, a product, yeah. uh, the product is, is much more about, about a service or a li alignment of values to what that uh, consumer is looking for. Absolutely. If it's not something that they uh, need something to cover their nakedness. Absolutely, yeah. And, and that's, I mean, that's where I come from. That's the, the work I did with companies a lot was from servitization. So it, it was going into machine building companies and telling them, look, um, you're not just in the business of selling a machine, you're in the business of helping the customer in his, in his production process. And at the beginning, that was like, they, they didn't want to hear that at all. And that's only how far it went. And then slowly you could see, and especially the companies that had been at it for a few years, suddenly they said, we want to be solution providers. And we have all this knowledge that we can use to give consulting services to our customers of how to organize their production and so on. So suddenly they became service oriented. But that was such a difficult transition as is, and that was just opening their eyes to see the customer, let alone society, nature, and so on. Um, all I can hope is that the times that are changing right now are making companies much more aware of what's going on. And, and I mean, the thought behind it is the co-viability, right? I need these systems to exist and function in order for my, for my company to be able to exist. But that's just a much further step than the first one. I'm sure I could talk further, but I don't want to take up all the space. We I hope can to always be in contact. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> definitely. Let's try. Thank you it. so much. I love that. Thank you. <laughs> um, as Kelly was talking, I was just thinking about uh, one of the one of the ways that that we can measure what people are valuing in a culture or their systems is what they devalue. And is there any um, thought or correlation around how um, my my words have gone out of my head as I stopped talking? But uh, as or as institutions occur um, and around the value or devaluation. So venture capitalists have institutions around that and poverty has institutions around that, but they're, 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 they come from very different perspectives and they're not treated in any kind of a way that, you know, the devalued institutions tend to be devalued. And so how does, how does that play into this conversation? What do you mean devalued institutions tend to be devalued? Well, like uh, you know, um, uh, in, let's say it's uh, an organization that, or a system around homelessness or social workers, or, as an example, uh, versus um, doctors and hospitals. Um, it's this, it's part of the same system. It's part of the same institution of caring, but the um, resources and the the uh, systems and the um, emotions that go into it are very different. In my opinion, I, I see that they are. But so you were saying for venture capitalists, that was your first example, right? That they are very, very have a very different value perception. I would say, right? Right. So then, versus um, yeah. microphones or or B Corp funding, that kind yeah. of thing. it's not seen on on any equal level. Even though it's part of the same, you'd think it would be part of the same institution, but it's really not. There's still levels and values and valuations that within those types of 
um, systems. And and that's that's why I used um, the example of how we understand value as, as one of the core parts of the presentation today, because at least from where I come from, from a value creation aspect, that to me is the core that needs to be addressed. That I think as a as a as humanity, we've with the system completely lost track of what value is and how it's created. Mm -hmm. I mean, what happened literally was uh, that's again 250 years ago that someone said, well. Um, value is is utility and utility we're in this hedonistic stream so it's all about maximizing happiness 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 and every situation is just a question of happiness versus uh, pain for example it's and still because if utilitarianism is, is is part of the value um yeah. value and valuation then you'd think that the person that cleans your toilet which is a job that you don't want to do and that should be high in that taking care of your parents or all the things that yeah. Want to do, uh, but those are actually paid the lowest, and those are actually those <laughs> professions, especially, are the ones that can't be replaced by robots or technology, as an example. Absolutely, and that's such a paradox. But that comes from the, the fact that we didn't stop at like utility equals happiness, but then we went to oh, how can we measure that money? And right. suddenly, it's not even about that anymore. It's all about where the money is made, right? So we've taking two steps away from actual value and now we're just looking at money and I think measuring GDP is the best example of that I mean the, the measure for our entire society of how well we're off is GDP and not really how well people are off I mean so I think that's what you're saying we have services that are incredibly valuable and 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 people that give their life to making other people feel better and they get nothing for it where, whereas others make infinite money with with a snip of a finger we were just talking recently about uh, the old uh, measurement that used to be, you see it on the TV when I was a kid in the 70s, 80s, maybe early 90s around um, quality of life indicator. We don't talk about that anymore. And why mm -hmm. is that? Is because the value that we've created um, doesn't actually relate to quality of life anymore? I'm not sure. Yeah, because I, I think it's just not primary. And in, in again, this is this is our paradigm, our economic paradigm. And, and the institution of value as like money has been so in, more and more ingrained in the last decades mm -hmm. and and everything revolves around that and that's that's i think so many things and personally i mean we've we've heard of uh, Burveki now a uh, crisis of meaning uh, personally i also think that that is a main reason for why we have so many people we have a psychological crisis we have uprisings and people i find don't find meaning in the world anymore because everything is just valued in money and that that is profoundly empty at the end of the day, right? So I, I really think that this is uh, uh, the, the core of a lot of things that are happening worldwide right now. Do we have any other questions? Kelly, I saw you say something, but you were muted. So I'm not sure if that was for us. Um. <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm glad that I was on mute. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. great. Um, yeah, well, if we have no more questions, um, I'm also happy to continue the conversation at any other uh, point in time. As I said, I would really like to at least explore this more and really find out how we can uh, dive into the services, understand the institutions and create a better service design from there. So um, I will be um, probably putting up a, a page on our wiki for that. And anyone who's interested in having conversations about this, please message me. Um, I might also make a LinkedIn post. Um, and so, so this to me, um, I would be glad if this is only the, the starting point of the conversation. Thanks, Tim. All right. Thanks, everyone. Um, stay safe. Have a great day and see you next month. Yeah, right. Thanks, Tim. Awesome. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Tim. Thanks.